Welcome to the City of Bakersfield Planning Commission meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern, and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. The agenda for this meeting can be downloaded at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, Chair Daniel Cater. Good evening. It is my pleasure to call to order the March 2nd, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Chair Cater. Here. Vice Chair Bashir Tash. Commissioner Biddle. Here. Commissioner Komen. Here. Commissioner Lomas. Here. Commissioner Neal. Here. Commissioner Wade. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you for attending tonight's Planning Commission meeting. This commission provides an opportunity for public participation in the development process throughout the city of Bakersfield. The Planning Commission considers a wide variety of projects, including subdivision maps, zone changes, general plan amendments, and much more. When applications are received, the city planning division analyzes the request. Planning staff will present the facts about the project along with their recommendation to the Planning Commission, who will approve an item or make a recommendation as appropriate. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item 3A, public statements. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the commission regarding items listed on tonight's agenda? Please note if you are here for non-consent public hearing item 6A, this is not the time to speak. You will be given an opportunity to speak when that item is called later in the meeting. Non-agenda item 3B, public statements. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the commission regarding items not listed on tonight's agenda? If so, please step forward and state your name. Seeing no uh, public speakers, uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item four, consent calendar items. All matters listed under consent items do not require a public hearing and will be enacted by a single motion. There will be no separate discussion of said items unless a staff member or commissioner requests specific items be discussed and or removed for separate action. May I get a motion approving the consent items? Motion. Commissioner Neal, do I have a second? I'll second that. Commissioner Biddle, commissioners, please cast your votes. Motion passes with, commissioner, with Vice Chair Bashir Tash absent. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item five, consent public hearings. Um, please note all items on tonight's uh, consent public hearing items um, 5A through 5E, or uh, 5F. Um, we've received a memorandum um, with staff recommendation to um, refer back to staff for a future hearing? That's correct. Uh, I was going to ask, since there are members of the audience, if we want to ask if there are any comments that would like to be given on those items so we can receive them and file them in the report? That's fine, yes, okay. we can do that. Okay, um, thank you. So um, subsequent, so staff's recommending item 5A through 5F be referred back to staff for a later hearing. Um, I would like to provide an opportunity for anybody in the audience wishing to speak on those items to um, request they be moved so that we can receive comments and file them with the report. Are there any members of the audience wishing to speak on 5A through 5F? Seeing none, and as this item will come back to us at a later date, um, may I get a motion to adopt staff's recommendation to refer this, these items 5A through 5F back to staff for future hearing. So moved. Commissioner Neal, may I have a second? 
I'll second that. Commissioner Wade. Commissioners, please cast your votes. I'm going to have you guys vote again because um, I need to put Bashir Tash's here. Oh. All right. oh, and also, please let the minutes show Commissioner Bashir Tash is here. It's 535. Motion passes, and we're moving um, items 5A through 5F back to staff. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item 6, non-consent public hearings. Now is the time for non-consent public hearing items. Before we begin, I would like to explain how each hearing will be conducted. Staff will first give a report, then those in favor of the project will be allowed to speak. Those in opposition to the project will be able to speak after all of those in favor have spoken. Please note each side will be given a five minute total time to provide rebuttal comments. Individual speakers may ask questions during their statements, but the questions will not be answered until the public hearing on that item is closed. If you'd prefer written comments may be given to the clerk who will provide copies to the commission. Please be respectful of others participating in the hearing by not repeating the remarks of previous speakers and presenting any new comments or thoughts in a concise and clear way. Mr. Johnson, would you please provide us your staff report on item 6A? Yes, thank you, Chair Cater, Planning Commissioners, members of the audience, thank you for attending tonight's meeting. This is item 6A, it's a general plan amendment zone change number 22-0128 and a plan development review number 22-073. This location is in Northeast Bakersfield. The request again is a general plan amendment and that will go from single family to commercial on 44 acres and from single family to multifamily on less than a quarter acre or roughly a 9,000 square foot lot. There's an company zone change with this project uh, for consistency and again, taking this from R1 to C2 PCD, and from R1 to R2. The plan development review for this project is for a self, self storage facility. So there'll be storage units, RV and boat storage, on site manager, quarters, and an office. There is a, few, there is a subdivision that has been submitted, but it's not before your commission on tonight's agenda. However, I just, it is relevant to this project, so I, will, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. Approximately 10 acres that surround the proposed commercial site will consist of 58 lots, residential, single family, uh, and the size of those lots are 6,000 to 12,000 square feet, and will provide a density of 5.86 dwelling units an acre on those lots. Back to the commercial project. Uh, again, 44 acres, there'll be 140 buildings, approximately 15, 000, or 1,500 units, and it will be constructed in six different phases. The storage buildings, as you see in the lighter tan color, uh, 12 foot tall, 12 and a half feet tall. The RV and boat storage buildings that are in the gray color, those will be 16 feet tall, just over. And then in the southwest corner of the site, you have a caretaker's quarters and an office. And again, that's 12 feet tall. The office, or excuse me, the entire facility will be open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week, closed on certain holidays. The R2 parcel that's being proposed, 
that will be constructed with a duplex that will be a ministerial action that will go through the formal site plan review project process. And according to the applicant, this duplex will be used for uh, Daryl's mini storage management, not necessarily the on-site manager. And at full build out, this is what the project would look like. Access is being taken from the existing Valley Street and proposed extending Vista Montana Drive uh, to interconnect with State Route 178. Initial study was prepared for this and was determined that a mitigated negative declaration was the correct environmental document. Therefore, you have mitigation measures associated with air quality, biological resources, cultural and paleo resources. Pursuant to Senate Bill 18, tribal consultation was initiated. However, there were no requests from the tribes to meet. The applicant did provide a community outreach meeting with the surrounding neighbors. Um, I'll briefly talk on that. Although staff was not in attendance, I'm sure the applicant will have more to say. But following that meeting, the applicant did increase the lot sizes per their request, uh, which actually reduced the number of lots to what I previously mentioned. Uh, in response, the neighborhood provided a comment letter back to the applicant with still some concerns related to the increase in traffic, no signalized intersection. The Valley Street width was smaller than Vista Montana Drive width. They requested custom or semi-custom homes or in lieu of those homes to provide a landscape pathway. No cell towers and they requested the RV storage be located towards the center of the facility. And those comments are attached to your staff report. Since this project does connect to State Route 178, that is Caltrans jurisdiction, Caltrans did submit a comment letter noting that the speed on this was 65 miles per hour and therefore between um, driveways and roads, they, re they suggest a 2,625 foot spacing and they noted that between Masterson, which is existing, and Vista Montana, which is proposed, is only 740 feet. Caltrans noted in the letter that limiting adjacent access connections is essential for the safe and efficient operation of a major roadway. Separating access connections at the recommended spacing of 2,600 feet allows drivers to respond to a series of situations instead of having to react to overlapping conflicts. To provide a little bit of history on State Route 178, in 1919, Route 57 was renamed to Route 178. The portion of 178 between Bakersfield and Lake Isabella was constructed between 1922 and 1932. In 1959, the portion of 178 between Highway 99 and San Bernardino County uh, was added to the California Freeway and Express System. And then in 1960, the state of California adopted a new alignment, a State Route 178, and all the following slides will show some more de detail on that. In 1995, City Council amended the general plan circulation element and adopted a specific plan line to reflect the new State Route 178 alignment. And you can see highlighted there is the current route which exists and the heavier bold line is where Caltrans has an adopted alignment of State Route 178. Our 2002 general plan circulation element map shows the new alignment as a future freeway and the current alignment as an arterial. So once the future freeway was constructed, uh, the current 178 would be downgraded to an arterial street. The same with the 2014 general plan circulation element map, um, except this time it's in color. Again, 1960, California adopted the new alignment. Fast forward 50 years, and in 2010, Caltrans um, published a transportation concept report, or TCR, and this is a document that planned State Route 178 through the year 2035. And you can see the alignment, the, uh, the adopted alignment that Caltrans has compared to the current alignment. The report takes into consideration reasonable financial and physical constraints. Specifically, it noted that east of Oswell Street, there are environmental and historical resources that could be problematic when constructing 178. There is nothing in this document that provides a timeline of when the adopted alignment would be constructed. Therefore, one could ascertain that that would not be constructed before 2035. 
in keeping with that alignment just north of mesa moran you can see the green line that goes forward and that's the proposed or adopted alignment in the orange line is the existing state route one seventy eight and then we have a map in the bottom right hand corner that shows the where deviates out and then you can see the project site in relation to the existing and proposed alignment so in order for your commission to approve this project there are three findings that must be made for the zone change in the plan development review the first that the project is consistent with the general plan and objectives of the ordinance second that the project constitutes a commercial environment of sustained desirability and stability and it will complement and harmonize with the character of the surrounding neighborhood and community and the third that the project justifies exceptions from the normal application of the code and that it it integrates such elements as the location of structures circulation pattern parking landscaping and utilities together with a program for provisions of operation and maintenance of all areas improvements facilities and services provided on the property and i'll go into more detail on that in a moment so your planning commission does have options when considering this project you could approve the project as requested and there are draft conditions associated or that are attached to your staff report you could approve the project with revisions and again those conditions of approval can be added deleted and or amended and when you're contemplating conditions of approval um, again, the project may be granted approval subject to such conditions as may be deemed appropriate or necessary to assure compliance with the intent and purpose of the zoning regulations and the various elements and objectives of the general plan and policies of the city or to protect the public health, safety, convenience, or welfare. When you're coming up with conditions, there must be a nexus for conditions. In other words, you can't request a traffic signal a mile away from the project site if the traffic study doesn't warrant a traffic signal. Conditions should not be used to restrict development, so you cannot put so many conditions on a certain project that it would be cost prohibitive for that project to be built. And there must be a reasonably achievable, um, or that the condition can be reasonably achievable. So in other words, there's been other projects along Taft Highway where Caltrans has commented that we need a 30-foot landscape strip um, which is a requirement on portions of Taft Highway. You can condition a project to comply with Caltrans comments like that because it's feasible. When Caltrans comes and says you cannot connect to 178, you cannot condition a project to connect to 178 because there's no reasonably achievable effect with that. Your commission could also approve the project with a more restrictive zone classification. And in this case, to allow for a Self-storage facility, the, most the more restrictive would be the exclusive PCD plan and what that, how that differs from the C2 PCD, which is being proposed, is that your commission would make a recommendation on changes and that would go to city council for final approval. Being mindful that the decision you make tonight is only a recommendation anyway to city council. If there's questions or information that you need to make an informed decision and that information can be provided within a reasonable time, uh, you can continue the project to a date certain by leaving the, the project open. And those two dates would be either March 16th or April 6th. If it takes longer to get that information or if it's unknown how long that information would take, you could refer the project back to staff, in which case it would be re-advertised to make sure that uh, the surrounding neighbors would know when it's coming back or you could deny the project for reasons made known at this hearing. Staff's recommendation is for denial and making that res recommendation staff considered several factors. And again, looking at the findings for approval, we question if the project was consistent with the general plan, goals and policies. Some it were consistent with and others it was not. For instance, goal three, which is to accommodate new development, which is compatible and complements existing land uses. So if this project were to be converted over to a commercial use from residential, and if the Daryl's mini storage were to back out for whatever reason, if they couldn't get connection with Caltrans, uh, the approval would remain 
commercial as C2PCD, in which case permitted uses in this site include all auto dealers, car washes, hardware stores, adult entertainment, conditionally permitted uses where you guys could add conditions on like hours of operation and such include an amusement park, banquet venue, and kennels. Goal four, would this project be phased, provide for phased and orderly development? And again, Caltrans noted in their letter that to minimize the safety impacts and to improve the circulation, Vista Montana Drive should not be connected to State Route 178. Caltrans therefore recommends that Vista Montana Drive should be intersect or should intersect with Masterson Road to provide access to State Route 78, being mindful that Caltrans controls access to their site. So this may not be considered orderly development if Caltrans is not going to provide that access. Also, policy 21 of the general plan is to encourage a separation of at least half mile between new commercial designations. And within a half mile here, you have two properties that are already zoned C2, and you have two properties that are zoned C1, which is a neighborhood commercial. C2 projects are typically located near um, major intersections, and they, and because the C2 Zoning, des zoning classification is for concentrated large scale retail operations that provide a broad range of goods and services which serve the metropolitan market area. So putting commercial right in the middle of residential along Valley in the proposed Vista Montana uh, does not necessarily provide for that half mile separation. The second finding for approving a zone change with the plan development review is that is the project sustainable, excuse me, sustained desirability and stability. And there are eight commercially zoned parcels located within about a half mile, one and a half mile distance from Kern Canyon Road to Comanche Drive. And those are highlighted with the red uh, and, and the other colors and highlighted with yellow or outlined in yellow. Out of those eight commercially zoned par properties, Three are developed, uh, one is partially developed, and I would note the partially developed one has eight acres that's not developed, um, but the self-storage unit just to the south of that is looking to expand into that area. So at least four undeveloped parcels, you have a 53 acre, a three acre, 15 and a half acre, and 11 acre commercial properties that are undeveloped. And given that the site is proposed at 44 acres, I would note that these other Daryl's mini storages in town, they do range in size from four acres to 34 acres. So that has an average of about 15 acres per site. So going back to this slide, that really leaves two viable projects within really a three quarter miles of this site that could be built with a Daryl's mini storage. You have 50, again, 53 acres at about 750 feet to the west and three quarter miles to the East, you have 15 and a half acres that all they would need is a conditional use permit to develop a Daryl's mini storage. Our business as usual is being reevaluated when it comes to general plan amendments and zone changes. We've received, a, and, and your commission is aware, there is a lot of general plan amendments and zone changes that go through your commission on the city council, which is an indication that uh, our general plan needs to be updated to reflect that. And as you're aware, our general plan currently is going through an update. And so what we need to do is, is establish a solid baseline so when we are updating the general plan, our environmental document is accurate and we don't keep going through a lot of general plan amendments and zone changes. We do often receive comments from property owners that are asking us, the city, what's the highest and best use of their property whether it's residential or commercial or industrial. And really that's an answer for the property owner. But with California's housing shortage, the rent prices here in Bakersfield, we have that missing middle piece, which are the smaller lots with the smaller homes uh, and our regional housing needs assessment. Residential is becoming one of the highest and best uses of property. Regional housing needs assessment or RENA that has been talked about in front of your commission uh, 
We have Director Boyle in the audience who has who's provided workshops on that. But to provide just a quick summary, RENA is a, sta it's a number established by the Housing and Community Development, or HCD, and they make a determination of how much housing at a variety of affordability levels is needed for each region of the state. And then it's up to the local governments to implement that number. And that number is established again with HCD in consultation with the California Department of Finance and the Council of Governments, in which case it's Kern Cog for Kern County. That number is then provided to Kern Cog, who develops a RENA plan. HCD reviews that plan, and then it's given to, in this case, the city of Bakersfield to update in the housing element. And then we report that annually through an annual progress report back to HCD. And that report does go in through your commission each year, and that is uh, tentatively scheduled for the next commission hearing at March 16th. And again, housing element is a key word here, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. So what is Bakersfield's RENA that's going to be in our upcoming housing element? We need to build 37,461 dwelling units for an eight-year projection period, which ends December 31st, 2031. That's approximately 4,400 units annually. We're still working on our 22 data for the annual report, but the annual average between 2018 and 2021 was just over 1,700 units annually. So HCD also recognizes that the scarcity of land with adequately zoned residential capacity is a significant contribution to increased housing development costs. Consequently, a lack of adequately zoned residential sites increases the already significant deficit of housing. Therefore, our general plans housing element must provide the necessary conditions for conserving, preserving, and producing an adequate supply of housing affordability at four different income levels. And this is partly done through our vacant sites inventory, which is used to determine what vacant sites can be built with residential development to comply with our RENA. And again, the city does not build houses, developers build houses, and so HCD states that a jurisdiction must maintain adequate sites to accompany its remaining unmet RENA numbers throughout the entire planning period. And any jurisdiction or a jurisdiction may not take any action to reduce a parcel's residential density unless it makes findings that the remaining sites identified in its housing element sites inventory can accommodate the jurisdiction's remaining unmet RENA. And this is done through several ways. It can be done by identifying a site that is not on our vacant list, vacant sites list, and that could be added as an offset, or they could rezone from commercial into residential to provide that offset, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one-to-one, -one. so if you're removing 44 acres of single family, we're not necessarily looking for 44 acres of a different single family. As an example would be, you could give us 22 acres of R2 or 11 acres of R3. We're, what we're looking for is density in this case. The housing element, why it's so important in these numbers is that state funding programs often require in local jurisdictions compliance with the housing element law. So these competitive funds can be used for fixing roads, adding bike lanes, improving transit, or providing affordable housing to communities. And again, if, if you don't have a housing element that's in compliance with state law, um, some of these funds cannot be accessed. In other cases, a compliant housing element will receive extra points if their application, application on their application, thereby increasing their chances for a competitive application process for funds. The ramifications of not having a or a compliant housing element is that local government governments uh, may face consequences that include ineligible for state and federal funding, as I just mentioned, subject to lawsuits and attorney fees, loss of permitting authority. Uh, financial penalties and require ministerial approval to hasten production of housing. In other words, certain housing projects would be considered compliant and would not require any discretion. This proposed project site of the 44 acres, if it was developed with 6,000 square foot lots as what's allowed in the R1 zone, that equals to approximately 300 dwelling units towards our arena. And it, as some developers are doing right now, if they're adding an ADU, 
accessory dwelling unit to these homes that's potentially six hundred dwelling units towards our arena the site was also identified on the vacant sites inventory list and no alternative site was provided third finding that we looked at is the circulation pattern is it integrated into the improvements and again caltrans noted that to minimize the safety impacts and improve the circulation vista montana drive should not connect to state route 178 caltrans would require any connection to provide a permit engineering evaluation report from the applicant for review and approval and then caltrans would issue an encroachment permit so regardless if your commission approves this project really the access to vista montana is at the control of caltrans if that vista montana drives access was not provided access to the self storage facility is approximately 3100 feet from the existing vista montana drive on the northeast portion of the site but of concern with that is fire code only allows 750 feet with the, with you might you must have a turnaround at 750 feet or be able to, for the fire equipment to continue driving forward so in essence, this could not be constructed even per fire code if Caltrans does not provide that access. So staff's conclusion on this is that the project as proposed does not meet the findings for approval. It is inconsistent with several general plan goals and policies. It does not constitute a commercial environment of sustained desirability and stability. It does not complement and harmonize with the character of the surrounding neighborhood. Alternative vacant commercial sites within the vicinity are available to include 53 acres, just 750 feet away. It does not integrate an acceptable circulation pattern. It poses safety impacts to drivers. It eliminates buildable single family residential land for unbuildable self storage commercial land. And it could place the city at risk with HCD. Therefore, it's staff's professional opinion that this site has not proven that commercial use is a better than residential. As such, staff believes this request is premature and recommends adopting resolutions denying the general plan amendment, denying the zone change, and denying the plan development review, and recommend the same to City Council. That completes staff's presentation. We're available if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The public hearing is now open. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak in favor of the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Good evening, Chair Cater, Commissioner, staff. My name is Patricia Newquist. I'm with Cornerstone Engineering here representing Daryl's Mini Storage tonight, the developer. Thank you, sir. Um, and thank you, Paul Johnson, Director Johnson. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I learned some things about the history of State Route 178. And also um, having you confirm that the um, plan to realign 178 um, goes along with our, um, the current general plan and circulation element, um, which we worked very hard to design our project around. Uh, first, I'd like to express on behalf of the developer our gratitude and respect to all the commissioners for taking the time to talk with our team about the general plan amendment and zone change and Daryl's mini storage PD plan uh, that's before your dais tonight. Daryl's services uh, need in the residential community and in doing so becomes a part of that community. The goal is to build a beautiful place that blends in well with the surrounding neighborhood. Daryl's has built a stellar reputation on providing excellence in the storage business, and beyond that, wants to be a good neighbor. Daryl's Mini Storage currently maintains 10 properties within the Bakersfield area. Storage units are in demand, and he does a pretty good job of maintaining a beautiful place for us to store our stuff. Daryl's uh, is a mainstay in the community, a destination place for photo shoots, whether it's prom pictures or quick family, picture by the fountain. I'd like to take you all on the development journey through the whole process from the eyes of the developer 
the broker, the planner, and the engineer. Let's start by looking at the raw land. A blank slate, East Bakersfield. Everyone I know that lives here on the Upper East Side loves it. The air is cleaner, the night sky is clearer. It's a wonderful place to live. Now ask them where the nearest grocery store is and, uh, you know, there's, there's a blank stare because we're lacking commercial in the east side. We all know that rooftops bring commercial development, so the rooftops have to come first. Daryl has worked on, uh, or worked with a local real estate broker, Brian Haupt, who's here tonight for many years. Brian uh, locates properties within residential areas that are for sale. I know a lot of the um, commercially zoned um, options that uh, Director Johnson brought to your attention tonight, they, they aren't for sale or they aren't feasible. So they're really off the table. Um, this particular property is for sale. It's in escrow with Daryl's. Daryl's has extended the escrow several times uh, to get the entitlements in place because it is contingent. Uh, the sale is contingent upon the entitlements being in place. So that's why we're here. We are looking forward to uh, remain on the current GPA cycle before the City Council on May 10th. And at this point, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars has been spent by Daryl's uh, and is invested in this property, and he is adamant about bringing it forward and building, building it out to fruition. As planners and engineers, we look at the underlying parcels. We look at the zoning, we look at the general plan, circulation element to guide us on the path of traffic circulation and allowed use. In 1989, the map you're looking at, uh, it's parcel map 8362 recorded. And along with that map, the full width right of way for Vista Montana Drive was granted to the city creating a collector street as designated on the city's general plan circulation element. In 1991, parcel map 9626 recorded and reflected the road right of way easement. Here's the city's zoning map included in the staff report tonight, also reflecting the street circulation. The general plan amendment uh, I'm sorry, the general planned circulation element was last updated in October of 1921. The arrow there shows you where the project site is. The uh, heavy yellow line is a designated collector bringing traffic down from Grand Canyon through the Vista Fenestra property and then diverted uh, west, as shown by Director Johnson, south to Highway uh, State Route 178. State Route 178 is shown as being realigned on the circulation element, and the existing location is deemed a future arterial road. If this was already constructed, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about Caltrans and their um, jurisdiction over this property. A right turn in, right turn out is what we're asking to gain access to the site, and we'll talk more about that a little later. So off we go on the design of the site. Basing all of the information we know with what the general plan circulation element shows us, what the underlying maps and dedications of right away have already provided. We submitted back in March of 2022 the first submittal for the GPA zone change. In August, we submitted pre precise development plan for Daryl's Mini Storage. It was my first personal electronic submittal. Yay for that system, it's working. On August 8th, we um, had our first submittal of the vesting tentative map 7419. Our next step was to have a uh, neighborhood meeting. We always reach out farther than the th recommended 300 feet. Um, by the city, so we obtained uh, from the city mailing labels uh, to include the entire neighborhood, uh, the Vista Fenestra, uh, all the city, um, so our city 
annexed property. Um, some of the county people came to our meeting, which was held on August 22nd at Cato Middle School. We received, we, well, let me back up. We, we sent out about 100 letters. We received 20 RSVPs, and we had about 50 people show up for the meeting. So it was an excellent turnout. Uh, the meeting was robust. We had questions. Um, it was hard to maintain the crowd until I could present what, what we were uh, presenting for the project. Um, but we allowed everyone to respond with questions and comments. I handed out a survey um, that they could fill out and give us their comments in writing. This is the Vista Fenestra neighborhood to the east of Valley. And this is my sign-in sheet. So as you can see, those that I had predetermined with email addresses, um, those were the RSVPs, and then these are the folks that showed up. After our meeting, well, let, let, me, let me read to you the comments. Here's the comments after the this, this survey from the meeting. Um, we asked if the participants at the meeting, um, if we presented the information in informative and, and clear understanding of what was being propo proposed for the site, and they answered 83% yes, 17% said no. We asked if they agreed that the developer was considerate of future residents and existing neighbors while planning for the development of the site. We had a 50-50 split between yes and no. And then all things considered, are you in favor of the Daryl's Mini Storage? And 64 at that time, residential lot development. We had about a third of them won over. Some of their comments um, said looking forward to it. Lots and houses should be compatible to the houses that are there, custom homes, 10,000 square foot lots. I'm a fan of Daryl's Mini Storage, 10,000 square foot lots along Valley. My first choice would be to have a wall of the storage building uh, along Valley, set it back with landscaping and walkways. Second, if houses are to be built, they have to be on bigger lots comparable to the houses existing on Valley all the way around. We bu built our forever home on Sunny Hills it's a custom, quiet neighborhood that is unique and special. I respectfully request you consider our thoughts, um, and you can read the rest there. Uh, oh, I love this one. More storage units. You should give informative classes concerning hoarding. Ha <laughs> ha. Seriously, no homeowner willing, willingly takes a $100,000 hit on their property value. I don't think Daryl's is going to bring a decrease in property value. It's going to add to the neighborhood. Uh, so those are some of our, lo our comments. We took uh, the design back to uh, Mr. Ridnour, Daryl's mini storage owner and developer, and he said, hey, I want to make the neighbors happy. Let's give them 10,000 square foot lots along Valley. I've been doing this a long time, and developers don't do this. This was phenomenal. This was a big concession. So we took it back to redesign. <laughs> that changed the um, footprint of the general plan amendment zone change acreage. We had to create new exhibits, new legal descriptions, create a new map. Um, and then after our August 22nd meeting, we shared it um, with the neighbors. Uh, let's see, September 12th, we sent an email out to the neighbors with a new layout. Uh, September 22nd, the neighbors held another meeting on their own. We were not invited. Uh, October 10th, we received a very nicely written letter with another option, and that letter is in your staff report. However, on October 11th, I emailed them and said, we're going to give you a formal letter responding to your thoughts by the end of the week, and we did. On October 21st, we responded. It was not included in your packets. I was able to share that. I have copies here with me tonight. If you did not receive a copy, I'm happy to get you one. Staff gave us, let me back up too. Staff had always been in support of this project. Um, they gave us a tentative hearing date of December 1st. That date was changed to January 19th. We put up the public notice hearing signs, and we, with every date change and instruction, we notified the neighbors. We let them know, hey, 
we've, we've got a date change, signs are going up, signs went up. And then on January 31st, staff uh, moved the date to uh, March 2nd, and we updated the signs. Uh, I'd like to, uh, let's see, think back here is, is the map that we, we gave them. That's the draft. It, it looks the same today. There were several of the neighbors that reached out, out to me um, independently of the group. And after the uh, official public notice went out to the 300 feet, um, I got an a, a email from Michael Kennedy, shout out to him, he prepared this. He said, so what you're describing is not different than what we agreed to at the uh, neighborhood meeting. I said, no. He said, this is how I visualized it. And it was very helpful. So it lays out 37 lots that are between six and 7,000 square feet, zoned R1, that's an existing zoning. Uh, the blue area represents the lots we changed to uh, 10,000 square feet or higher. And the one little yellow lot down there at the end next to the entrance of Daryl's is the R2 zone for a future duplex that will be uh, exclusively for the use of Daryl's um, executives. So I thank him for that big shout out. He kept everyone kind of in check on the next door app and uh, we appreciated that very much. All right. Daryl's built another facility at Stockdale and Claudia Autumn. Um, I hear a very famous person lives in that neighborhood. We won't say who, but you would all recognize him. Uh, there's about 14 lots there. As you can see, just south of the Daryl's storage site, those homes um, or those lots were created, and they were sold to Froelich. Froelich built those homes out. The reason I'm showing you these is what we're trying to do is build a cohesive neighborhood. So when you drive into Valley Street, you see houses on both sides. They're both going to be 10,000 square foot lots with relatively the same size homes, semi-custom, custom. custom. Um, and when you look over the entrance to Daryl's and also to the south, you look over the residential, you don't even see the Daryl storage. You see rooftops and you see a uh, wall. So that was the point I wanted to make is the neighborhood um, view from the street will be the homes eventually once they get built and until then you'll see the beautiful Daryl's wall um, but you're not going to see anything above that you know view site the uh, canopies for the RV storage are about 18 feet high um, they they won't stand out is the point I'm making the PD plan that you see before you is going to be developed in six phases. The initial wall that extends around the entire perimeter of the site is actually uh, the storage units. So those are the initial phase. Phase one includes about 190,000 square feet of storage. Um, the maximum amount per the site plan at full build, build out would be 889,300 square feet. RV storage is about 430,000 square feet. Uh, the landscape plan, uh, Daryl's is notorious for putting in some beautiful landscape. And again, you know, it's a premier site for photos. Um, Rios Design Studio created the, the landscape plans for this site. Um, most of this is going to be fronting uh, State Route 178 and, of course, in, in front of the uh, Daryl's office and residence. Elevations of the office residential quarters were included, and I noticed that um, staff included some of these beautiful pictures. I know you're all familiar with Daryl's mini storage. Either you live near one, you drive by one, or, um, or you've taken photos there with your family, right? <laughs> They're beautiful. Oh, I kind of skipped over that real quick, but a lot of attention to detail is put into these facilities. Well, let's talk Caltrans, kind of the elephant in the room, right? Um, again, basing our design on the uh, general plan circulation element, the right-of-way is already given. Those maps are so old, you'd think they'd be grandfathered in. Um, but 
What I want to show you here is when we designed a site further uh, east at Comanche and 178, we obtained these pavement delineation plans from Caltrans, they're dated 2014. And you'll see the arrows there depict the right-of-way of future Vista, Montana. Uh, this is PD6, and then PD7 uh, goes further east, and you'll see Valley Street there. Um, you notice on the south end of, of Valley Street, there's another street called View. That's less than 700 feet away. Um, I've got some aerials I'll share with you later, too, that, um, well, let's see. I don't know if I put this in the right order. This is the plan we're working on um, with Caltrans. This actually depicts um, the uh, improvements. The green line is the boundary and right-of-way. The red line is the new edge of payment. The blue line is the new striping, and the yellow is the existing striping that will remain. The right-of-way is already given to the city. Um, it will be taken by Caltrans once we have an encroachment permit um, and plans are approved through Caltrans. We're very confident that in working with Caltrans, we can achieve a right turn in, right turn out here at this location. Uh, we have committed to get this worked out with Caltrans prior to the tentative map coming back to the Planning Commission. Um, and we believe if we stay on the uh, current track of a May date for a uh, city council hearing, then we'll probably ba be back here in June with our tentative map. Moving on, I wanted to show you a couple other layouts of 178 as it transitions. This is to the west of the site. And you can see uh, Masterson there in the upper right-hand corner. You also notice that the um, convenience store and the, um, I think it's a Chevron station, uh, they barely have any desal lane and they have uh, an inlet there to their site. And I think that's a Tony's uh, that also has an inlet to their site. This is Masterson to the bottom left and the um, a boundary adjacent to our property. There's six lanes there, three on each side. You can see where the D cell lane starts for the right turn to Masterson. Vista Montana would come out right around there a little to the little to the west of that so if you are doing a right turn in we would extend the d cell lane further east uh, to turn into the vista montana when you're turning right turn out there you are in a d cell lane so you have plenty of space to accelerate to move over to one of the three lanes that are they're coming into traffic we feel this is a very safe route the um, comments from Caltrans and their letters are based on their guidebook that um, state you need to be the, the 2,000 feet away. Valley Street is that, at that setback. We could flip this and put the Daryl's Mini Storage on the other side and have Valley Street, which is a designated local street, guys, and we told the neighbors we're not going to create more traffic for you on Valley Street, but it could be done. Um, getting uh, additional right-of-way on property we don't own to the west of the site to connect to Masterson. Is that doable? Yes. Does it cost more money? Yes. Do we own that property? No. No, it's, it, it would be a task, uh, indeed, if, if we were conditioned through Caltrans. But again, we remain optimistic that we're going to reach um, beyond the, the planning and, and preliminary review level where we are today. We're going to reach someone in engineering and operations that can understand that 178 is never intended to be a freeway and allow the right turn in, right turn out. So that's our goal. Um, we are promising to get that done before we bring the tentative map back to you, which will be conditioned, be conditioned with all the improvements 
uh, all the infrastructure for the development. Uh, I'd also like to remark that uh, we reached out to Public Works. We had a meeting with staff, with, with Manny and Susanna here, and with Louis uh, Topit. Um, uh, Jose Fernandez was also there. Oh, and one correction. Jose Fernandez is the staff planner who's working on this project, and he was in attendance at the neighborhood meeting. So shout out to Jose for showing up. That was great. Uh, Ken Weir actually showed up as well. Uh, so that was a nice, pleasant surprise, and he learned about the project at the same time the neighbors did. All right. Um, at that meeting with Public Works, I just wanted to mention that uh, Louis Topete was around in the trip development of the future alignment of 178. He said this was never intended to be a freeway. He recommended that we submit a permit uh, encroachment permit with Caltrans so that we could get our foot in the door at that higher level, which we're very desperately trying to, to seek. We responded to Caltrans letter. Uh, we did that January 23rd. We were just discussing that. And I reached out to David Deal, the planner, and he said he's working on a response to our letter, and we should have it this week. So it, it, the working it out with Caltrans is in, in progress, and and we're very adamant about getting that resolved. On February 14th, we received notification from staff that the project sat on Alquist Priola fault zone and that they needed seismic study to determine if any future mitigation is required. Um, and we had a deadline to submit. That was the 21st of February. We did an urgent records request with the city uh, clerk and thankfully, um, someone in planning was able to find the historical uh, studies that were done back in the 80s for that site. Um, there were several trenches that were dug to locate the fault, uh, including uh, Vista Fenestra neighborhood to the east. Uh, nothing was found, and so Vista Fenestra was allowed to build those homes without any setbacks. And we are thinking we'll have the same result. Um, uh, the developer did hire soils engineering to prepare a review of the historical studies and um, prepare a, a letter um, concerning the seismic activity on the site. Uh, from, that, um, from that letter, there were several lots that were outside of the seismic zone area. Uh, lots 1 through 17 on the west side of our, we're talking about our track map, which is not before you tonight for approval. Um, but lots 1 through 17 on the west side, that includes the residential unit within the Daryl's commercial site. Those are fine. Lots 54 through 58 are fine. Uh, but the ones in the middle, um, it was recommended that we do additional trenching. And so that is already contracted and underway and we will have that resolved prior to tentative mapping as well. Um, the commercial side is not affected because those are uninhabited buildings, right? It's just the residents that are affected. All right, Rena, let's talk Rena. Um, I truly believe our state government has all the right intentions when it comes to passing these assembly and, and Senate bills, I truly do. Uh, we're, hoping, we're hoping that somewhere along the way we're gonna find an answer to affordable housing. Uh, I stand firm in that belief. Um, they're trying their best to, to help the residential crisis. And there have been a load of bills passed in the last couple of years. It's hard to keep up with them. Um, Assembly Bill 2011 and State Bill Number 6 allow residential use on commercially zoned property. Um, I had some questions, actually, when I was diving into this. I shared this with uh, some of the commissioners that I found that answer, and I would love to dis discuss this further with Director Boyle. But in the RISE uh, website, the General Plan Existing Conditions Background Report that was done August of 2022, You'll find all the assembly bills and Senate bills I'm talking about, but what's lacking are the two that I just mentioned, 
AB uh, 2011 and SB 6 are not reflected on this. Um, and boy, do we appreciate all the hard work that staff has been putting into the, the new general plan. Um, now I understand better um, because of these maps, thank you for having them there, what the uh, vacant inventory um, is surmised from. We, we had on your agenda tonight an extension of time for over 564 lots. Um, those are subdivided lands. My question was, does the inventory include land that's, that's been subdivided, that's shovel ready, ready to put homes on? Uh, no, it doesn't. It turns out the vacant land is what's pre-zoned. And if you go back to, let's see if I've got this in here. These are other examples of how close um, from a roadway and even some private properties have access to 178. And that's Comanche and 178 right there with their uh, shorter than Masterson uh, right turn lane, but we've got Comanche to the right of that too. So I looked at the regional housing needs. Um, first thing I went to was, okay, how many lots do we have available to build? Um, remaining from the approved tentative maps, and there have been several legislative acts that have allowed these maps to have an extended life. Typically, it's three upon approval, two, three year extensions, year nine, you, you record your final map, you've got you know, another two years on your vesting, but these maps, some of them were approved in 2003. They're old, they're 20 years old. And we're st you know, still extending them because of the legislative acts that have given them an additional year, additional two years, additional 18 months, and on and on, um, based on the economy and based on our housing needs and, and everything else. So my, my answer, uh, or my question was answered with, um, with the uh, vacant inventory being anything pre-zoned. If you go back to, here's the city's um, zoning map, look at that, yellow. All of that is pre-zoned residential. That's uh, tens of thousands of acres um, that is presumed residential. I don't feel like we're upsetting the apple cart by taking this residential property and zoning it commercial if there's indeed legislation that takes effect July 1st of this year, it's good for 10 years, the deal will be extended, that allows a residential developer to come on site and build homes uh, on a commercial zone pro property. So there's no net loss here. So here we are near the end of our journey. It's been a wild ride, wouldn't you say? <laughs> we are here tonight to respectfully request your support and approve the project as it's uh, laid out before you tonight. Approve um, a recommendation of approval for uh, the city council in May. And uh, Daryl Witten of Cornerstone is here, the engineer of the, on the project. Uh, Karen Kendall with Daryl's Mini Storage is here. If you have any questions concerning uh, any of the Daryl's facilities or any infrastructure or anything further, well, I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to speak in favor of the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. My name is Daryl Whitten. I'm with Cornerstone Engineering, and I'm here to speak in favor, but in particular, I want to talk about Caltrans. Um, I've had two meetings with Caltrans about this project. First of all, Caltrans sends us this letter, and the letter says, oh, you want to you wanna connect Va Vista, Montana to Highway 178. Well, we can't allow that because we we have this plan, we're gonna turn Highway 178 into a freeway. And you can't have, we've gotta have at least a half a mile connection. Well, this was news to me because I, I worked for the city for five years, I'm familiar with this situation. If you look at this map, you see um, a corridor 
on the adjacent property to the west for a future freeway for 178. And somebody at Caltrans Planning seems to think that that doesn't exist. I've had two meetings with them and gone over our general plan uh, circulation element and explained to them that Vista, Montana is a part of the circulation element and it has to connect to Highway 178. I've had crickets since then. I wrote a, a letter following up these two meetings saying, hey, are you guys gonna let us have a connection to 178 or are you gonna tell us that the city's been wrong in their circulation element for the last 15 years? And so I haven't heard back from Caltrans on that, but I'm hoping that somebody in the planning department will talk to somebody over in engineering and figure out that engineering does not plan to turn 178 into a freeway. If they do, I think a lot of the people in this room will be really upset over that. But um, so I'm, I'm expecting that in the future, in the very near future, Caltrans will come around and say, okay, Vista Montana is already a circulation element, a dedicated uh, collector, and you can connect up to 178. The right-of-way is already dedicated, and the city has a plan in their circulation element to make that happen. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on real quickly is 44 acres of R1, residential. Um, I've been doing land development for a long time and 44 acres will net out to about four dwelling units per acre if it's R1. That's about 180 units. Um, now, I, I realize, Paul, that you may, may have counted auxiliary units or something, but I can't see how we come up with th over 300 units on 44 acres. Um, and there are a lot of maps, approved tentative maps, that have been around on the books for almost 20 years that still haven't been developed yet. Taking this 44 acres is not gonna even be a drop in the bucket because uh, at, at the rate we're issuing building permits um, and, and the city's willing to issue them as fast as builders can build them, right now we're still only issuing about 2,000, less than 2,000 uh, units a year. And I don't see how we can meet the, the goals that are set by the state with or without this 44 acres. So those are my comments and I'm available here for questions. We please ask your support for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other audience members wishing to speak in favor of the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself and proceed. Hi, I'm Brian Haupt, I'm, with, uh, I'm the broker on helping Daryl with this site, and I just wanted to speak to the fact that we did look at some of the commercial sites, the areas in right up there, but you couldn't buy them at a price that we could afford to build a storage facility on. Uh, we did talk to those owners at the time, and it just was not affordable. Um, in regards to the zoning, I think what we get from this meeting is a C2 PCD, and the PCD becomes the zoning, if I'm not incorrect on this. And, and to build anything other than the Daryl's Mini Stores, we'd have to come back and revise the PCD. So I appreciate what uh, Director Johnson said, but, and I had to take, um, I was taken a little bit back because he used a car wash and adult theater and something else. And I thought, wow, that's a big one. But anyway, we have to come back if there's anything other than what you've seen on the site plan. We have to come back for another legislative act on this. Also, addressing the Reno on this thing, and it's nice uh, that the state comes and says that you have to build this many houses, but we've had this particular property on the market. I myself have been handling this for four years. We've just gone through another boom in housing in Bakersfield, and not one real estate a housing developer wanted this property. I'm an east side boy, born and raised. I love the east side. But the unfortunate thing is when uh, people come to look at homes in Bakersfield, only about 20% of the people, the buying population will actually come up here and live. It's warmer in the winter, it's cooler in the summer. You get the mountains, you get everything. I understand all that, but for housing developers, um, the numbers aren't there for them. So just because we say you could build 300, 
or 140 houses up there doesn't mean it's ever going to happen. We, we, went on, we worked on this thing for years and still haven't got to that point. And there's no map approved on it anyway, so theoretically they could come in, there's three parcels, they could build three homes and, and call it good. Be awfully big yards to mow, but that's what you would get. So anyway, we, we just thank you for your support. We thank all of you for the meetings and the help that we've had in it. And uh, I think Daryl's will be a very good use for this property. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers in favor of the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Good evening, everyone. I'm Edward Robinson. I'm a resident of the city of Bakersfield, and uh, I am a community social worker. So uh, I recognize fully that you all are the planning commission here, uh, but I'd like to propose a unique perspective, which is uh, in support of this project, uh, with the caveat that there be some sort of uh, contingencies for uh, adding value precisely to the community, right? Um, and, and, and this is where I believe that this can be uh, advocacy on your behalf, right? Um, making requirements to uh, be di have diverse hiring practices or certain uh, people that are used, uh, uh, as well as uh, you know addressing uh, the uh, the wall, you know, this is going to impact the residents' lives tremendously as far as the noise and uh, the amount of traffic that's going to come. So uh, if this is approved, then, uh, you know, I, I saw it, there's a regulation. Uh, it looks like it's uh, 17.08. Uh, point one eight zero fences, walls, and hedges. Talks about how it uh, can't be over uh, six feet unless... Uh, you know, it's required city state regulations for noise attenuation or site screening. I think that that would be something important uh, for to consider and, and ensure that that's there so that the noise isn't impacting the uh, residents, uh, their quality of life. Additionally, let's talk about how, uh, you know, there's going to be traffic. So, I mean, I didn't necessarily see anything for traffic calming measures. I didn't see uh, how there would be. I, I know that they're going to do uh, have things to beautify the property. I know that Daryl's does traditionally have uh, very unique uh, entry points in you know, the property, but uh, traffic calming measures are arguably also uh, adding certain greenery along the perimeters, right? And those are things that cause people to recognize the beauty of the neighborhood and the community and the overall city of Bakersfield. So uh, those would be some things that I would suggest you advocate for uh, the, the community members, the residents, by suggesting these practices, right? These are things that are within your power, and if we're going to move in this direction, I'm just putting it on the table for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last call for uh, any additional speakers in favor of the project. Seeing no additional speakers in favor, uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. And if we have multiple speakers, uh, I, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. If you wouldn't mind sitting in the front, we have a request uh, for a five minute break. And uh, if you want to sit in the front row, we will reconvene at, let's just call it 6.50, maybe seven minute break. Thank you. And thank you for coming to the end. Um, I believe the, uh, time to reconvene has come upon us. And we have uh, many speakers waiting to provide comments in opposition. So if we could all reconvene, um, find your seat, please. Thank you. Um, I will reconvene the meeting at 5.51. I believe we are now hearing speakers in opposition. To, oh, I'm so sorry, 6.51, um, wishful thinking. Um, I will now have, invite speakers in opposition to the project up to speak. Please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Good evening. My name is Efren Gomez. I won't just say that I'm a city of Bakersfield resident, but rather a resident of Vista Fenestra neighborhood. 
having lived there 20 years on the street for the namesake street of Vesta Finestra. And so um, I'll try to be concise and get to the point uh, without first, uh, typically it's kind of the, you know, what happens to my home value. I'm not gonna re really speak to that, but I know a comment was made that whenever uh, Daryl's goes up, uh, automatically, presumably for some odd reason that the home values go up, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen a study. Uh, I haven't seen any statistics that make comparisons from a uh, certain decade to a previous decade where Daryl's didn't exist that tell me, oh, it's 100% certain and factual that I, we can actually go to the bank that home prices will rise because of the existence of Daryl's mini storage. Uh, getting back to these community meetings, I, was, uh, I did attend the first one. I did not attend the second. But to presume, because, to presume that um, 50 persons showed up at 100, uh, meaning 50%, does not mean that everyone is in favor. I attended as a good uh, citizen, as a, as a resident of the neighborhood. And to say that um, because, first of all, using a basis of 100, uh, does, not, does it really mean 100 persons? Uh, th that is the block that we determine whether a decision should be made, or is it beyond the 100 persons? I believe more than 100 persons live in Vesta Finestra neighborhood uh, anyway. But do we limit it to that particular block? Do we, or do we not cross over to the other side of Vesta Finestra on 178 to another uh, neighborhood? Do we extend it to East Hills, the, I guess, the newer, um, newer residents of the East Hills? Um, or do we extend it to uh, Vista, uh, excuse me, to Comanche, uh, um, Comanche and um, Harold, I mean, Comanche Drive and 178. So where does this uh, 100 stop? Do we stop at 100? Do we take into account other neighbors? And I, I don't think that just saying it's 100, that we have 100, therefore that's the voting block and that uh, if we get 50%, that's a, that's a yes. I don't, I don't think so. And to presume that because uh, some persons wrote in in favor does not speak for me. Uh, I think I have my own voice. I have, I'm independent of others thinking. And uh, because someone said, oh, great, I want one, does not mean I do. And I think it's it very presumptuous to say, well, because so-and-so said it, that means everyone else that was silent or didn't attend, therefore they're uh, foreign. Uh, I, I don't believe so. But the, another issue here is uh, concerning, again, not in particular order, is uh, that particular area. I can say, because having lived there for 20 years, that uh, there are earthquakes. Uh, we feel them more significantly than in other areas. Why? Well, that's just where earthquakes occur, at least smaller ones. But when they do occur, there is an increase of intensity because of the type of soil that's located there. And to state that because maybe some map somewhere or using some jargon of the industry, BCP, ABD, whatever the case may be, it's a case that things do not remain stable. And because something existed 20 years ago doesn't mean, well, it's not gonna change. Uh, if that's the case, I think then we really need to rethink the way we think. We need to, if we're gonna look at this, is, is there issues of earthquakes? Are there, you know, are they uh, increase in intensity? Are there other things to look at? I say there is. I've got cracks uh, on my house, on the floor. I mean, I, we live with it, we'll re we repair it, but that's a consideration. Um, another issue there is when uh, those that were asked that appeared to say, well, what would you, I mean, what, what would you like? Uh, would you like these things there, these uh, amenities? I think the, the better question would be to ask a homeowner or those in the area that might be impacted, and again, not limiting it to that, th those that block or parcel of Vesta Finestra, but be going beyond that is asking the person, if it was in your absolute control, you having a total authority and just making uh, a decision, would you rather see the dry grasslands, absent of any uh, building, any structure, vehicles, or would you rather have some type of building there? And I think I would probably say most of them would say, 
I'd rather have nothing there. Okay, so I think that's the question. And I think if people are given that question, they're probably saying, I'd, I'd rather have it free of any. Um, regarding uh, uh, Daryl's ministry, you know what, it's great. I understand he's a multimillionaire. He started in Los Angeles creating movie sets, and that's what movie stars needed. But um, the, the issue is, how many, uh, how many um, Daryl's mini stories do we need? If the issue is, well, you know what, when the question was asked of the residents, well, where's, uh, where's, a, uh, uh, where's there's no commercial? Well, you know what, there's no, I don't live next door to a Walmart. That's okay. I don't live next door to CVS. That's okay, too. I, I do have a car. I guess I could always go by bike, but the, the, the absence of some major retailer next to me is not dismal, and it's not something that, I'm, that I worry about. And so it's okay. But do, if, if there's, in regarding hierarchy of needs, it's probably a, a Daryl Mini storage. It's not going to be my primary need. I, I, I guess probably a gas station. Yeah, I need gas. Probably school for my children, although they're out of the house. I would think maybe some supermarket, uh, maybe some restaurant, uh, maybe a community center, but uh, a, a mini storage to park uh, excess vehicles, stuff that might have, it's probably down at the bottom. That's not really one of those things that in life that I said, I've got to have, a, I've got to have a, a mini storage. And typically, those are uh, transitory in nature for those that may be moving. But most of the time, you see RVs. Uh, they're, they're more a sign of affluence, and it's not poverty. If there is, then there's probably multiple families. I, I understand there's a need. There's a need for a lot of things. And so for me, uh, the, another issue is you know, turning right off of Valley to get onto 178, and then having this just before I get to another signal light at Masterson, have another set of cars just coming to the right. And uh, I think we all understand that uh, that's a society. People don't drive properly, correctly. Um, they're they going to turn in front of me. And so that's a, a consideration as well. Uh, as far as aesthetics, um, you know, to state that placement of green grass couple of redwoods, and by the way, I have two giant redwood, redwoods, uh, 60, 70 feet in, in height. To say that the placement of two redwoods, a fountain, and some granite rocks, and by the way, I have granite rocks in my yard as well, is to say, well, this is all-inclusive, and this should be appealed to everyone, and this is a package. I, 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 that's, not, that's not what drives people. That's not a, an issue. The issue is, is can I live here? Is, is it safe? Is, is it affordable? Uh, it, are there homes? Are, are there, is there transportation? Is there bus routes? Uh, but to rely primarily and or as secondarily or tertiary, say, well, you know what? I, it, 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 because the aesthetics are pleasing, then I think that's worthy of approval. I, I, I don't believe so. Um, I live there, and for me, uh, if 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 by some means we had to place something, I don't think Daryl's would be the first. And again, no disrespect to Daryl's, I can just say a more, uh, more buildings to house more RVs, more cars, more boats, and other stuff that our garages can't hold. It would be, I guess it would be maybe housing. And uh, my question is, is Maybe nobody buys, and maybe there's, there's uh, no developers putting homes up. Maybe there might be a reason. Uh, maybe I know there was water was always an issue. Building far in the Far East was an issue. Uh, sewer, um, and then you've also have uh, the soil, which is pretty difficult. I haven't built a pool. One of the reasons is you have to put triple walls, double the gunite, double the the steel frames, it's just a lot of movement. If you ask most uh, builders, they'll tell you that. And even those in City in the Hills, uh, if you've read the newspaper over the years, there's just multiple ongoing existing problems and lawsuits. 
And so maybe the builders have a reason why they don't want to build there. Um, so you couple all those things together, and maybe that land, I think, is useful, but maybe for something else that really requires a lot more thought. Um, and this thing about the old maps and new maps and 178 diverting, you know, I, I think here I've learned myself is, you know, some of my best decisions are those that I really think on. It's, it's not quick, not trying to please anyone, but I, I want to be sure that I'm making the right decision. Um, and, and so it's intent, uh, intentional that I take my time. I wasn't planning to speak, but, um, you know, I, I think I should speak up. I, I live there. Uh, again, just more than a mere citizen. I have a, a vested interest, if you will, in the neighborhood. I, I like it. There is some solitude. But uh, again, if, it's, if we want to look at building homes, then certainly there's a, a lot. Bakersfield can go from all the way to I-5, the, the way it appears. And so it's beyond that. And maybe it's cheap. And I think that's what may be a driving force to find that lot. It's cheap. But again, as I live there, these are things that I just wouldn't, uh, I couldn't reconcile. Um, I, I don't want to say I'm, I'm going to move. It's, it's, but uh, again, uh, looking at that, I, I see if, if we're going to do something, then maybe down the road, homes with a caveat in there. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for um, kind of hear me out, and um, thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Oh. Sorry. That's OK. Oh. Uh, please uh -huh. uh, state your name and proceed. Yes. Hello. Um, good evening. My name is Linda Weldon, and I'm a retired teacher. I'm one of the first original homeowners in Vista Finestra. And I built a custom home. Every home in my development was built by individual custom builders. And it, it really is kind of upsetting to me to think that the city wants to redesignate that residential area to a commercial zone in between two residential developments. My daughter has almost a 3,000 square foot home in City in the Hills, and she hasn't had any problems with her home there. Um, as an independent builder, um, my cousin has built three homes in Bakersfield, two, two stories on Rustic Canyon um, by Dr. Juliet Thorner, and um, one in Rio Bravo, we have the Bakersfield Country Club on the south side of 178 and Rio Bravo further on out 178. We have Tuscany, which is uh, in the hills of uh, the northeast. And I grew up in Orange County. Um, there was Anaheim Hills. Uh, Corona Del Mar had some hilly areas, uh, Laguna Hills some of the most beautiful developments in other cities have been developed in the hills. Um, as far as cracks in development, a lot of it depends on the care that a contractor takes in the development of building a home, whether they put like rebar in the driveways or you know how, how thick the footings are and the foundation of a home. A lot of these things, you know, if care is taken, you're not going to have these problems. And I think it was a learning process in some of the building that first happened in some of the custom areas of Northeast, more so probably around uh, Dr. Juliet Thorner in that area. Um, off of Panorama Drive and in between Fairfax and um, probably Morning Hills, or Morning Drive, I guess. And I taught for probably 17 years at Dr. Juliet Thorner. My daughter currently teaches for Bakersfield City Schools. We have uh, Cato 
on the junior high, the new one that's built on the south side of 178, as well as Fletcher, the new elementary school. And at the end of Masterson, there's a planned uh, new school to be built in between Panorama and Patagonia. As a teacher, I have concerns of a storage unit being built in that area between uh, Vista Finestra and Masterson because I think of the kids, you know, walking to school and, you know, going, people coming and going from storage units don't always live in the area. Sometimes they live in other places and they drive in and you have more transient traffic going into storage units with kids walking to and from school, standing at bus stops in the neighborhoods. You know, I don't think you need a commercial development between residential. And right now, I see driving um, to my daughter's house. I take care of my grandson every day while she's teaching, because I'm retired now. I see um, a lot of homes being built behind um, Vista Finestra, uh, all the way to Morning Drive. And, you know, I, I feel I've lived in my house since 1993, and I've seen a lot of development in the area. And I think the Planning Commission can really consider trying to get some really nice developers, like they built that beautiful bell cord. And I think when my daughter and I went out there to look before she bought her home in New City, and their base price at the time was in the 300000 range. Now it's gone up a lot higher because they built some more expensive homes in there. But, you know, the base price in our development is probably in the 400000 on up range. You know, I know one house um, this past summer sold in the 500 and, you know, close to 75,000 range. And so I really think that you need to consider when you put a commercial development next to a residential area like that. And the other thing I'd like to say, when you drive east on 178, it's so beautiful. When, the, when it's all green, it's almost like you're driving to a different country. The air is cleaner. We always have a nice breeze. And there is a storage unit back behind the Chevron station um, that's at, it's at that one intersection where the stoplight is. And I have to question, why do we need another big storage unit in our area right there? It doesn't make sense to me to have something like that. And most of the homes have big garages, and you know some of them put like a shed or something in their lots because they're big. So I, that's just my opinion. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not used to talking in front of a large <laughs> public meeting, but <laughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. They're appreciated. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, please step to the microphone, identify, identify yourself, and proceed. My name is Christina Rosales. I am a resident in the Valley Street area. I'm actually one of the primary residents on Valley Street. We appreciated Daryl's doing a meeting with the community um, and sharing their ideas and plans of what they intended to do. There was, again, an alternate alternate meeting of residents that didn't make the first meeting amongst ourselves to let them know what Daryl's was proposing, what their questions were, their concerns were. We drafted a letter which was shared with you um, from the community of our thoughts and concerns. A couple of things I wanna address of what they were saying about the new one, Highway 78, supposed to be going behind our community. Caltrans put a lot of money in in the last few years. I don't have the exact time. I've been a resident out there 11 years, and within that time, we had to go through a freeway expansion. 
Highway 178 was not always three lanes, and it's not three lanes all the way through. If you go down 178, if you've ever gone to the Kern River, or you go out to Calm and see Holiday Light, you see that there is the expansion. We do have three lanes where it comes down before City in the Hills, and it goes just past Masterson before it comes back down into two lanes before we get to the left turn lane to go into Valley Street. When they're asking that this Daryl Mini Storage come into 178 and be a right turn only, Right turn means that we're gonna have traffic coming into the left turn of Valley Street, having to do U-turns to go back onto 178 to get into the right lane to go into this storage facility. Not everybody obeys the rules. We live out there, we see it. People who are not familiar with the community, they'll do U-turns in the middle of the freeway, they make the wrong turns into the Chevron station. This is gonna cause a lot of traffic concerns for the residents out there. People will not drive all the way to Comanche to make the U-turn where the designated light is, unfortunately. People just don't like going any farther than they have to. If you're not somebody who likes living in the distance and in the community, then you don't appreciate the distance you have between things. Um, in terms of when they address the earthquake, there is no earthquake faults, fault lines out there, but there are earthquake fissures. If you look at the assessor's map in front of Valley Street, there are multiple earthquake fissures, as well as on Vista Fenestra Street. We are all aware of those. We see the damage that occurs in our homes. When the Ridgecrest was having multiple earthquakes happening, we all sustained damages in our homes, on the concretes outside, in our driveways. We're aware that it's gonna happen and we just live with it and deal with it and hope that one day we don't have to use the insurance that we have in our homes to do major repairs because that's another head headache all in itself so with that speaking of that i am aware because of the fishers i'm sure that daryl's mini storage is getting this property at a prime price because this property has been for sale since i've been a resident out there and has not moved so instead of taking the for sale commercial property that is just on the other side of masterson why wouldn't you go for a cheaper property and put storage and put rv parking unfortunately us residents are going to see this facility with the RV parkings that are going to be 18 feet high because brick walls cannot go 18 feet. Residents can't have them, businesses can't have them to totally cover that. We do see the storage unit that is off of um, Highway 1 or SR 184, which is not very far from us in Morning Drive. Daryl's currently has a unit out on China Grade. I believe it's China Grade. It's right off of the underside of the hills that they are currently doing an expansion construction on. They are currently in construction on Fairfax Road next to the World Church. And it is to my understanding that people off of Morning Drive will also have access to this storage facility. So it is a concern to the neighbors of why are we putting in so many storage facilities when there isn't even the homes to put it. So we're getting traffic from outside of the area. We do have an elementary school coming in at the end of Masterson. We're hoping for a high school because of the number of children and families out there. And I'd like to see this land stay designated as residential to accommodate the growing Kern County. People think Kern County isn't in a big boom. We're getting people from Los Angeles, from other counties that is too expensive to live in. And it has driven up our prices for people who are our younger generations who are trying to make this a resident and a home. We wanna make affordable living in Kern County for the people who are born and bred here. I was raised on the east side, I moved away and came back because the Northwest is just too crazy, too busy. I like the slower pace of the Northeast Bakersfield. I'd like to keep it that way. I wanna keep it beautiful, keep the ba Bakersfield beautiful as it was always designated. We appreciate you guys hearing our concerns. We do wish you consider and move forward with the denial of this project and thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone uh, who wishes to speak in opposition to the project? If so, please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing no additional speakers in opposition, uh, before we move to the rebuttal, does any commissioner have any questions for the public on this item? Remember, this is not the time to express any opinions on the matter, only time to ask questions. Oh, um, we're not quite at rebuttal yet. Are there any commissioner? No. Oh, yeah, you can feel free to sit in the front room. Though. Yeah, thank you. Are there any commissioner questions? Okay. Uh, commissioner Coleman. Uh, thank you, Chair Cater. <clears throat> I 
A couple of questions uh, for staff. Well, I don't know if this is staff or for the developer. Had they uh, considered uh, a plan that had the project turned around so they didn't need the uh, access uh, for via, I'm sorry the name of the street, but the access from Valley? Commissioner Coleman, uh, staff is not aware of a submittal with different access points. Uh, the developer can answer whether or not they evaluated that. Uh, Commissioner Coleman. Uh, yes, it was considered, but our, our intention is to have the entrance off of Valley Vista because we don't want to add to the traffic on Valley. Valley's a local street with houses running on it, and we'd prefer that the, the mini storage traffic uh, come off of Valley Vista because it's, it'll mean fewer trips going past the residential housing on Valley Street. And, and you can stay up there for a minute. Did, did, uh, did, uh, Ms. New, <coughs> did Ms. Newquest intend to say that she wants an acceleration lane and the deceleration lane to Masterson. So it's a decel lane coming into Masterson and she wants to use that as an acceleration lane? No, the, we're, we're gonna have to work with Caltrans on that. Okay. Caltrans has a very long decel lane onto Masterson. I think it's too long. I see. But when we, when we start dealing with the, the connection with Valley Vista onto Highway 178, we're gonna have to work with Caltrans on that. We're, we're planning a decel lane of our own um, so that right turns going on to Vista, Montana can, can be done safely. Okay, and then uh, this question is probably uh, for Mr. Halp uh, regarding uh, vacancy in that, vacancy in the uh, storage rental storage market in that area, what the vacancy factors are. Do you have any information about that? I don't know what the term they use in the, re in the rental business in terms of whether it's a vacancy or occupancy or. It's uh, this Brian Haupt, it, they do say vacancy. Okay. Um, the unit just down the street is full. Okay. And he himself is looking at options to expand it. I don't know that he has any concrete plans yet, but right now I think across the city, um, most of the uh, mini storage facilities are running under 5%. So there is a demand for it, especially now that so many houses are being built that are on a smaller scale because the smaller homes have much less storage in them. And we people tend to be hoarders, so we have to put it somewhere. And is it is it true there's a light at Masterson? I'm sorry, I don't remember myself. There's a light. It looks like there is in the in the map. Okay. Yes. And, and then my last question is for Mr. Robertson. Um, do you live in the neighborhood? Hello. No. Uh, I'm a community social worker, so uh, okay. I wanted to bring some things for your consideration uh, and for the community members' consideration that may add additional value. So okay. that's all I was doing. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Are there any additional commissioner questions? Commissioner Biddle. Mine is for Daryl. You said um, with Caltrans, you heard just crickets, not a no. What did you mean by that? So I've had two meetings. They were Zoom meetings with Caltrans planning. And then I followed up with a letter. And the letter went to them about six weeks ago. And we've been waiting to hear from them because the written documentation that we've gotten from Caltrans has led me to believe that whoever's in planning thinks that 178 is gonna be, a, it, this portion of 178 is gonna be a freeway one day. And that's why they object to this connection between Vista, Montana and Highway 178. 
But 178 is going to be rerouted in the future, and this, this portion will, will be given back to the city, and it'll be a, a, a collector street. And so this is a perfectly appropriate connection given what the future plan for Highway 178 is. But the people in Fresno, I haven't, I haven't been able to get past the planners, and I don't think the planners understand um, what, what they're, they're responding to. And so when I say crickets, it means that we've been asking Caltrans, are you going to respond to our letter? Are you going to respond to you know, the, the things that I brought up? Because in my letter, I very specifically say to them, look, here's our general plan. And 178, where you say it's going to be a freeway, is not going to be a freeway. And once I get somebody at, in Fresno to understand this, I think things will start moving along and we can make arrangements to submit plans and have a connection that's been planned by the city between Vista, Montana and Highway 178. I guess my next question is for city staff. Has it been crickets as far as Caltrans? Or are they part of the site review process? They commented in a letter in the first part of December. We have, we have not had reason to engage with them. And then my other question was on the housing units. I, I heard 180 from one side, and then I heard 308 from another. How do, how do we find those numbers? Simple math would be just take 44 acres and divide by 6,000 square foot lots, um, but then you'd have to account for potentially internal roadways and such. And the reason I say 6,000 square foot lots, that's what's allowed in the R1 zone but those could potentially go down to 3,000 square foot lots. We have those in the R1 zone that uh, are being looked at right now. I think since we have Chris in the audience, could we get a little bit more of an explanation on SB6? And is that gonna have any kind of impact on, on Bakersfield? Commissioner Beno, I, I can actually address that, the issue. So SB 6 and AB 21, um, they were signed into law in September of 2022. And specifically, they target qualifying below market rate and mixed ex income projects that pay prevailing wage. They're very specific, very specific type of projects that they apply to. So um, just to give you an overview, uh, Senate Bill 6, would not require rezoning, uh, but it would require that the site be 20 acres or less. It would require that um, there be a skilled and training workforce and that it be constructed um, by paying prevailing wage to the employees. In terms of uh, AB 2011, it allows for the process to be streamlined and be processed through the ministerial review um, however, it also is very limited to the types of projects, um, two different types of projects specifically, 100% uh, affordable housing developments and mixed income housing developments along commercial corridors. So yes, they, they, they are a law that's gonna go into effect um, actually July 1st of this year, um, but again, they're very specific type of projects. And I don't know if that is the type of project that um, the applicant was envisioning. So pretty much it makes public funds like, or private funds like public funds. So it limits the use and using prevailing wage. So that's pretty much what it does. I, it, it does, it allows housing on commercial property, but in limited circumstances, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Biddle. Commissioner Neal. Sorry, I am. Um... Thank you. I had a question about um, this is for Ms. Patricia Newquist. Um, she commented that staff had always been in support of the project, and I just wanted more context on that statement. Yes, Commissioner Neal. Thank you. Um, when we submitted the package back in um, March 
of 2022. It's almost been a year. Um, we re reviewed the project. We reviewed the zone change. Uh, we reviewed the fact that it was going to be a Daryl's mini storage. Uh, we sat with staff. We talked to staff. The staff was supportive um, in doing the, the GPA zone change. We were blindsided when we got the staff report. So last Friday, um, we opened it up and saw the recommendation of denial and immediately reached out to Director Johnson. So it was a surprise. Um, I understand um, the unresolved issues with Caltrans that we're working on uh, being the main driver. Uh, the arena never came up, was never discussed with us. So yeah, we, we were surprised. It was being uh, a project that was being supported. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Johnson, do you, um, Mrs. Newquist said that staff had always been in support of it and provided the context. Can you please provide a response for us? Yes, thank you. Typically when an application is submitted, if we identify that it cannot be supported right from the get-go, uh, we will inform the applicant as such um, as a, as typically we don't want an applicant to go down a road where they're just gonna spend money for a potential denial. In this case, and in other cases where projects are submitted and there's no reason to initially deny it, or we find there is a reason for denial, then we always say yes, we will support the processing of the project. However, through the public hearing process, whether it's public notice, whether it's circulation of an environmental document, there could be comments that arise that could change staff's position. Uh, in this case, when the Caltrans letter did come up, um, as was mentioned earlier, we did postpone at our request, um, coming to forward to your commission in hopes that uh, the applicant's optimism of working it out with Caltrans would come to fruition. Um, we were then approached latter part of January or so, and we were told that this project sh was requested to move forward to your commission. I was, I, the people that asked me of that, I did inform them that our recommendation would be for denial. Um, I'm, I don't know if there was a miscommunication on their end, but uh, when this was coming forward to your commission, uh, the applicant's representative uh, would have been informed it was a denial, and I did that. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand you. So in the beginning of the application process, if it's clear on its face that it's something that staff can't support, the applicant is usually told that as a measure to assist them with not expending maybe unnecessarily the fees. That didn't happen in this case. Um, and that's not a requirement of staff to do that, but it's almost a favor, right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask um, the applicant if the average size of um, storage facilities is what I'm hearing is about 15 acres. Why is the applicant requesting this? And this would be its largest facility. Why is it requesting so much? of this R1 land be rezoned? Commissioner Neal, thank you for that question. I should actually have Daryl's mini storage representative, uh, Karen Kendall, come up and answer this, but the demand is there. Um, storage units are full, and um, there, there are many storage units in town, but People store stuff. You know, we, we take it there, we store it, we forget about it, we, we visit it once every year or so. Um, it's a great business plan, uh, but the demand is definitely there, and the storage units are full. And um, as far as the size of the, of the location, it just fits. Um, putting the infrastructure around uh, to help facilitate the cost of, of the streets, um, keeping that uh, cohesiveness with the neighborhood by developing uh, buildable lots around the perimeter. Um, 
it's just what's left over. It's the, the middle piece, uh, the 44 acres that we're changing to commercial. Uh, it, it just fits. It just happens to fit the, uh, the constraints of that site. Thank you. I don't, I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Commissioner Neal. Commissioner Lomas? My question's for staff. A couple, just two short ones. Um, currently, the current designation for 178, it's alignment currently. Caltrans has ultimate authority on its access. That is correct. And do you know, because uh, I sure don't, um, the timeline for the new alignment and what, and have they even identified a funding source? Uh, that is information I cannot answer. Uh, Caltrans has not provided it to us other than through the 2010, and again, this would be a 12-year-old document through the TCR, uh, which anticipated, which anticipates 178 construction through the year 2035, and within that document, it did not provide a timeline for that alternative route. Thank you. I just had a quick clarification for staff. Um, is, um, is Taft Highway a similar designation to, to Highway 178, or are they different designations? as far as Caltrans jurisdiction? I'm gonna have the Public Works answer that question one moment. Thank you. Take your time. Has it already been answered right on the 5205? Oh, yeah. They're both state routes, and they're both supposed to be six lanes. So currently, they're they're the same. Yes. And so, as state routes, they're they're both under the jurisdiction and purview of Caltrans. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And then my second question would be, um, if there's a clarification between the 2,600 foot between roads, does that also apply to ingress and egress of commercial properties? That applies to when it's a freeway, when you just have interchanges, not in a freeway, you wouldn't have commercial access. So that's what they're trying to protect. So in a freeway, there would be no commercial access. Correct. So a road that currently has freeway access to commercial properties that becomes designated a freeway, what does that process look like? They would, I don't know, that, that's a Caltrans. That'd be a Caltrans clarification? Caltrans, okay. yes. I'm just curious, thank you. Um, I think those are my questions for now. Are there any other questions from commissioners? Seeing no additional requests for speaking, um, we will now provide a rebuttal period, uh, which will provide an opportunity for those in favor and those in opposition of the project to respond to um, what the opposing side uh, brought to our discussion tonight. Um, Please be respectful and note that this is a five minute total time for all speakers. So I'd request if multiple speakers wish to speak, if you would come to the front uh, to save time and for speakers uh, um, earlier in the queue, if you would be respectful of others behind you to make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, so with that, is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, to provide a rebuttal on this item? If so, please prepare to step to the podium. Um, and I already said that part. So um, again, five minute total time. Um, we will begin with those in favor of the project as we just recently heard from those in opposition. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you start the clock uh, and would you state your name and, and proceed? Okay, my name is Gerald Whitten. I'm with Cornerstone Engineering. I'm speaking in support of the project. Uh, three item items I want to address. The first one is seismic. Um, several of the residents have mentioned, oh, we have earthquakes out there, there are fissures and fractures. Um, this area does show up on an Alquis Priola map, which is a state map that's, that is supposed to map potentially seismically active areas. My understanding is that after the 1952 uh, White Wolf quake, that there were a few cracks that opened up in this area but subsequent investigations 
um, for instance, the investigation of the Vista Fenestra area indicated that they couldn't find any, any faults or anything active. So nobody really knows why this is still on Alquis Priola. That being said, and, and a lot of people refer to that as an AP map because it's hard to say Alquis Priola. I don't, I'm probably not even saying it right. Um, anyhow, we are gonna, we're gonna do some trenching out there. We're gonna find out if there are any active seismic uh, fractures in the area. And we may have to redesign the project to account for that, but I don't think we will because there have been two other investigations and they never turned anything up. But we're gonna answer that question. But my next statement would be that if this is a seismically active area, then the kind of commercial project that we're proposing would be more appropriate for it than residential. Um, and that brings me to traffic because the traffic that's generated by 180 or 300 residential units, especially in the peak AM and PM period, is gonna be a lot higher than mini storage. Storage units generally have people that trickle in and trickle out through the day, and they mostly have their, tra their, their traffic on the weekends. So if the residents are concerned about traffic, then this is a project they should support. And the last thing is, that um, Daryl has done a lot, the, the way this project is designed, the mini storage is gonna be very well screened from the adjoining neighbors because it's gonna have residential development all around it except on Highway 178, which will be screened by a screen wall and a generous amount of, uh, of landscaping. And so we think this project is gonna be a very is gonna actually answer a lot of the questions that have been brought up tonight. It's not gonna cause traffic problems. It's not gonna cause noise. It's gonna be compatible with the, the whatever seismic concerns they have. We're gonna investigate those and make sure that, that they're mitigated. And, um, and it's gonna be a beautiful project that will be screened and, and isolated from the neighborhood. So I ask your support on it and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers wishing to provide rebuttal comments in support of the project? If so, identify yourself and proceed. Hello, Edward Robinson, City of Bakersfield resident and community social worker. What I'm hearing is that there is a uh, need that's potentially being met by uh, Daryl's, right? Um, this is potential growth that's happening. Uh, and, and I also hear some fear from uh, community members, uh, some concerns uh, that seem to resonate. They, they seem pretty valid, right? Especially when people are vested in the community. But uh, I just feel as though, you know, Daryl, you, you gotta really consider uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance principles. Uh, you gotta consider the environmental footprint and how this is gonna impact the community exactly and what you're gonna to do to reduce or alleviate some of these uh, negative impacts to the community members. I think that this is at the forefront. I think that you all have the ability to, uh, you commissioners have the ability to really make this impact. And I would just really like to see a robust discussion around how you're gonna address some of the concerns that the residents have brought up. I think that it's great because it means growth. It means growth, it means that a need is being met. Uh, so that's why I'm in support. I see that, and, and, and let's be honest, I mean, we have the homelessness uh, thing that, that we're addressing. We ha need affordable housing, but I also see that there is a tremendous opportunity to engage in a salient conversation here with these community members and their concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with 10 seconds remaining, uh, if anyone wants to shout something from the, the dais, otherwise, um, we will uh, provide a rebuttal period for those in opposition to the project. Madam Clerk, if you would put five minutes on the clock, and if the first speaker wishing to provide rebuttal comments in opposition would step to the microphone, um, introduce yourself and proceed. Christina Rosales, and again, I just want to reiterate about the highway and it being pushed back to Caltrans. We all need to take into consideration how long it has taken the construction of the 58 freeway, the Westside Parkway, and Highway 99. 
that 178 connection to the canyon is going to be a very long ways out. It's going to be probably after 2035 by the time it is reconsidered. This town doesn't move fast on that side. It does move fast on building residential homes. And that's what I'd like to see. There is a lot of commercial land in this area. Let's keep the commercial land commercial, the residential land residential. Good evening again. My name is Efren Gomez. First of all, I have no financial interest in this project. I am neither the general contractor, neither am I a subcontractor or any, any other trade that would make uh, money off of this to support my lifestyle or anything, any purchases I may want. Now, if I was the general contractor or the engineering company, and obviously, you know, it's all for money. I would certainly be here and be, be the first to say that it should be approved. But I'm not. I, I don't have a, a financial interest or no other interest in this matter, wholly than being a homeowner uh, living in the Vista Fenestra neighborhood on the namesake street. Now, I hear uh, I'm not a community social activist because um, I have not heard Daryl say that uh, that through this project that they would assure that the general contractors and all subcontractors would hire a certain percentage of minorities uh, who may be uh, disadvantaged and for whatever the reason, that they would use them through some apprenticeship program, that they would have a source of experience, gain some knowledge, and be able to continue with their skills. I haven't heard anything about uh, possibly that uh, maybe those that are actually homeless would be, would be utilized to construct uh, this project. I haven't heard that this particular building, I've never heard of a Daryl's Mini Storage actually housing homeless individuals. I haven't heard any social causes other than it's, it's a, a nice, um, we all need to, you know, have, uh, everyone needs a, a, a personal storage and we're hoarders. But again, I, I, I'm looking back just as a <laughs> person with no vested interest is um, the, the fact that there's building upon building or establishments of storage facilities does not necessarily mean we should just continue and everything's okay because we've built one in the past, therefore it should be okay. I, I'm not. I, I, I think we need to re-look re at that, is revisit the whole issue is just because we built it, does it mean we just need to keep building until we build nothing else? Um, the other issue here is um, regarding these fissures. Uh, to, to state that there isn't one now doesn't mean there won't be one in the future. Uh, there's been fissures and earthquakes that have been discovered that were heretofore unknown to scientists or, or geologists. Uh, but again, um, I live there, and this is what matters. And you know, kind of getting back to this humongous uh, size, uh, from 15 acres being the average to 44 acres, is like, well, I, I guess in this case, I have to a little bit of NIMBY in me, not in my backyard. It's like, well, you know, there's plenty of space in Mojave. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, Maybe, you know, out towards Red Rock Canyon, there's facilities there uh, that these facilities can be placed. But, you know what, let's just be real. I think that's, um, you know, we need, uh, California's growing as so we're ev everywhere else. You know what, let's build, if we're going to build, let's build houses. Let's build something that can last. And to say, well, you know what, it's better to have concrete steel buildings and structures rather than homes, I, I just don't see that. So that's my, this is my personal opinion, just as a resident, uh, having no, no financial interest, I'm not gonna make any money off of this, and just someone that uh, likes where I live. Uh, thanks everyone for just, uh, for uh, again, um, allowing us and me the opportunity to, to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, right on the dot. Um, all right, um, 
Thank you for providing rebuttal comments. At this time, I will now close the public hearing on this item and return it to the commission for comment and action. Any commissioner who wanting to speak first, now is your opportunity. I'm the chair, it's rude to go first. Uh, commissioner Lomas, did you? Uh, it's not rude, you can go first. No, it's protocol, uh, I, I insist. Okay, I really didn't wanna go first. Commissioner Lomas. All right, so I got five points. I took copious notes. Nobody could read them but me, but I took notes. <sighs> All right, big problem, Caltrans. There's actually two really big deal breakers. Um, one is Caltrans. They are the authority. Um, currently, the designation for 178, we all know where that is. And Caltrans has authority of the access points. City doesn't have it. We don't have it. Um, council doesn't have it. Caltrans has that authority. We don't. So even having this conversation is premature in my book. Just because the, that, that deal breaker has not been settled. Um, number two, okay, so let's move the access point then, okay? Let's, let's move it over to Valley. The nether deal breaker, fire. There's, there's nothing been demonstrated to show that you, if you did that, we've not been, we've not been presented with that. So it's just been put out there. Well, Fire's saying no, that's another deal breaker because there's no way to turn a truck around because you can't bring it around on Vista. I don't have a map in front of me. So it can't be done. So you got two deal breakers right now. Then we go into, okay, well, we're the planning commission. We're supposed to be planning here. So when I look at, if you could, um, Paul, hey, Paul. Could you bring up the map that showed the surrounding commercial and you put all the acreage? It had lots of red on it. That one. No, too far. Okay, that one. You gave, no, the one that showed the acreage. Sorry. You had one that, that said how many acres there were. That one, sorry, I thought it was red, my bad. Okay, if you add that up, it's 90.5 acres. And if you look at the bottom left corner, you didn't even add that one. That's a C2, isn't it? The bottom left corner that doesn't show acreage? It is, and the reason I didn't show acreage is because it's partially developed. Yeah, but it's still there. It, it so, is still there, yes. Yeah, so it's probably 20 acres, 15? Likely so as I did not show acreage up on the one on Comanche, southwest corner oh, yeah, of Comanche that one 178. Too. So bottom line, in this little area right here, we already have over 100 acres of commercial. So, okay, that's, that's a consideration. Um, Patricia Newquist said something interesting, a couple things interesting. She said, the first thing she said was, we really need a grocery store out here. And she says, there's lacking commercial in the area. But I think what she was, was referring to is developed commercial. So we're gonna go with that. And she said, we need rooftops. And she also said, we're in a residential crisis. Well, we're all aware, I mean, most people are aware the state of California is mandating that we deal with our housing crisis. So then now we've got that other problem. So we already have residential established here. So now we wanna make more commercial, another problem. 
so in the last when you add those up for me what what we're supposed to do is worse we have a general plan and granted it's being reevaluated but when i look at these things i look at need and benefit and i think it's up to the applicant to provide and prove for need and benefit and the only and I am sorry, and I really don't mean to sound disrespectful, but I don't know how to say it any better. He, the, the applicant said they've already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, but that's not on us. That's, that's on the applicant to, prov to provide a reason for us to say why this should change. I don't think that's a good reason. Respectful, I'm really trying to be respectful with that, but I, I'm trying to identify the need and the benefit, and I didn't hear it anywhere. But I'm hearing the neighbors don't want it. I don't see the need because we have over 100 acres of commercial in the mix, and we've got two deal breakers. We've got Caltrans, and we got fire. So I'll get off my little soapbox. Thank you, Commissioner Lomas. Commissioner Coleman. Uh, thank you, Chair Keeter. <clears throat> I want to start by saying that I always make myself available to meet with applicants or members of the public uh, that have that want to talk about any particular issues that are on the agenda. And for the record, I did meet uh, with the applicant, uh, Patricia Newquist and Brian Hout. Uh, and uh, Michael Bowers is a former uh, commission, commissioner, and uh, uh, I, I appreciated uh, the introduction of the program to, to the project and the uh, uh, the information that you provided. So, so thank you very much. I, I also appreciate that you did the neighborhood outreach. You know, oftentimes we find projects that come to us and. The developer never has met with the community or, uh, around the, the project, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I also appreciate the comments that uh, Ms. Weldon and uh, Ms. Gonzalez and uh, Mr. Gomez shared with us tonight. Um, you know, uh, they're very sound points, and I, I appreciate you coming here to, to share those tonight. Um, <clears throat> The one point I want to make is that uh, those lot, that, that area being zoned R1 right now, under the current environment in California with the pressure from the state, is a developer could come in tomorrow and start building those pretty much uh, by right, I'm sure. Uh, we would have very little uh, oversight to that. So. You could very well, very easily wind up with 300 houses in that uh, in that same parcel of land, um, and, and I don't think that the uh, the earthquake argument is really relative re relative to this project. I think it would have less of an impact on a storage facility than it would have on residential houses. Um, we can, and getting back to the whole growth issue, we just can't have no growth. There are. Uh, 13,000 approved lots out in that valley, and it's just, the growth is just going to come. So uh, we, we can't stop it. The only thing we can do is manage it. As a commission, uh, we look to try to find, you know, uh, projects that are uh, good for the community. Um, I, I did want to make a comment about somebody mentioned a historic record that was from the 1980s. Uh, I am offended by that remark because <laughs> so, I remember the 80s. But uh, but moving on, <laughs> uh, I understand the comments about Rena, and uh, uh, you know we're involved with the League of Cities, and uh, every community in the state of California has issues with the state over Rena numbers, and uh, you know so far they don't care. Uh, uh, in my personal opinion, before they're ever going to be able to achieve their goals, they're going to have to start throwing some money out, and the money hasn't followed. They just made the demands that we do this, 
And I, I think you heard Mr. Johnson say earlier that the city, does, the city doesn't build houses, developers build houses, and you have to give them incentives to build houses. Uh, so that would maybe explain why it's being so slow out there to get those started. Um, really the question before us is do we take the R1 lots uh, and make them commercial? And uh, I guess uh, I, I want to back up to my comment about Daryl's mini storage and my appreciation for them because they do build very, very good projects. Uh, uh, the project that they point out uh, on Stockdale uh, is a very nice project. You really don't know that the mini storage is there. Uh, they built the same kind of deal where they have uh, houses along the, uh, along the street there that kind of shield that. So, you know, if you're across the street, you're just seeing another row of houses. You're really not seeing that, uh, that mini storage facility. So uh, I, I do want to compliment uh, Daryl's mini storage from some, for some very, very nice projects that you guys have built in the community. And I think Daryl's has demonstrated that they're a good community uh, partner, or member anyway. And so uh, with that said, um, I think that from a neighborhood perspective, I think you're gonna like the, you would like the mini storage maybe more than you would like houses in that area. Uh, but uh, I think the question before us is, do we take these R1 lots off the, uh, out of circulation and make this parcel commercial uh, when we have no certainty that they're gonna be able to get that uh, Caltrans approval? And uh, uh, as far as the Caltrans approval, uh, the city has very little juice with Caltrans. In fact, I, I think that the more that we demand, the more less they cooperate with us. And so historically, uh, Caltrans has done what Caltrans wants to do. And uh, we have countless examples of where the city has just been stuck with things that Caltrans has done, and we have to live with it. And so unfortunately, we can't advocate on behalf of the uh, developer with Caltrans. Um, so I don't know that we can approve a project that can't be done. Uh, we, you know, we, we can't make another agency do anything. And so I, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what kind of motions will come from the commissioners uh, tonight. Uh, I would like to see, because I do think it's a good project for that parcel, I would like to see some kind of uh, uh, resolution that, uh, that allows maybe more time for this developer to secure that, uh, uh, that approval if it's, uh, if it's imminent. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to see something that's extended for a year. I think we uh, all would like to have some resolution to this, to this project. So uh, I think with that said, I think I've said it about as much as I should say, so uh, that will be into my comments. Uh, thank you, Com uh, Chair Cater. Thank you, Commissioner Coleman. Next, we have Commissioner Biddle. Oh, so I'm the planning commissioner for this area under Ken Weir. And over the last week, I've spent a lot of time driving out there to kind of get an idea of what the community looks like and what their needs are. And with that, I drove all around Ward 3 and recognized a lot of the issues that we have in our areas. We have a lot of food deserts, and that was brought up several times. Going out into that area, we want to see expansion. We want to see our foothills really represent what our, co our community needs. and we're not seeing that right now. Right before this project, we saw six other projects that are requesting extensions of time. Now, I understand it was removed, but that's what we keep seeing within Ward 3 is extensions of time and vacant land sitting. I've heard from residents and the developers and the real estate that this land has sat underdeveloped for a very long time. And if we don't move on it, it's gonna continue to sit underdeveloped. Now, growth for the sake of growth is like a cancer cell. I don't wanna see that either. But when we have a private developer looking at a site that is set vacant for something that is a need, we've also heard 5% vacancy rate. Our, our, our housing vacancy rate's 1%. We're not that far off. I did speak to several of the, the 
residents that live within the Rio Bravo Country Club have been longtime residents as well, and they drive all the way to Allen Road to keep their RV. They're about 75 years old. They've chosen the retirement life. They love living out at Rio Bravo Country Club, but they have to travel all the way to, what is that, Allen Road to get their RV. So the need is there. This is a hard one. You know, Caltrans didn't say yes or no. That's what I was kind of waiting for. No decisions are made before we get here, where we hear what the public has to say, what the residents have to say, what city has, staff has to say, and then we take all that together, and like Barbara said, we got a bunch of notes that mean nothing to anybody else but ourselves, but this is a lot to take in. And hearing that Caltrans didn't say no, but didn't say yes, didn't really give me a whole lot to go off of on that, other than it's not on my desk. That's not my decision, and if Caltrans denies this project, that's on Caltrans' desk, and then it'll have to be worked out with the developer, not necessarily us, but I, I don't really know that still. So, I was intrigued to hear what the rest of my commissioners said, and they sound almost as dumbfounded as I am. But with a Daryl's mini storage comes beauty. I mean, I was in high school and guess what? I took my senior pictures outside of one too with the water fountains. And you're seeing that all around town. You drive by Daryl mini storages, they are beautiful. They do not detract or they do not bring in crime. They detract it. They've got security cameras. They have a manager that will be living there on staff 24 seven. That was huge for me. I live right behind my restaurant for that reason, to be there 24 seven to make sure nothing goes wrong. With housing comes more people and more needs for resources. Water is a huge issue in all of Kern County, all of California, and with more housing and more single family dwellings means more need for resources. That's more need for our fire department, our police department, our water, our trash, everything. I'm a fan of, of more densification in our urban core, so to see more want for, for single family housing, I know it's needed, but it kind of steers me away from keeping this an R1 residential area. Because with these, these extra acreage, I know it's commercial, but I see a grocery store, I see a gym, I see a community center, I see those things that are needed to go ahead and bring the developers in to want to build this to residential. Because right now, nobody's moving on this property and you're gonna see it sit empty for another 10, 15 years. So I guess I'm curious to hear what the rest of my commissioners have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Biddle. Uh, next we have Commissioner Neal. I just want to thank the applicants and also the community members for coming and raising really salient points um, and showing up uh, for your neighbors um, to speak um, uh, out on this project. The, uh, the other commissioners, um, Commissioner Biddle, Commissioner Lomas, Commissioner Coleman, have already raised points that I agree with, um, especially the need for a grocery store um, so the, the one issue that I want to address is the idea that this land will continue to sit undeveloped if we do not approve this project. Um, I think that's false. Um, so I read a report recently that the city of Bakersfield is the number one um, major city uh, for affordability. We are the most affordable major city in the state of California. That is a beautiful thing. Um, because of that, um, we are expanding in absolutely every direction. Um, this city is, and right now we don't have to, we don't necessarily have to infill. We should consider infilling um, to help us meet our housing needs, but we're able to build out still because there's vacant land still surrounding the perimeters and we keep annexing more land into the city. Um, so um, the fact is, is that um, this land will eventually sell um, as zoned for residential purposes because we are seeing that happen all around the perimeters of the city. And there are a number of factors that could have played in, and I, and I loved hearing about some of the faulty building issues, et cetera, that may be impacting, or in the earthquake uh, zone, that may be impacting why or may explain why this land has not necessarily sold. Um, 
but also you got to consider that we went through a recession and now we've gone through a pandemic and we've gone through price escalations on the cost of commodities and building and all these sort of things. And I think what Daryl's has done here is recognize the true, the value of this land. Um, it is valuable. It is valuable land. And if it's below market because of those issues or if it's not as expensive as commercial land, then I don't understand why we would want to convert it over to commercial space because my objective is to keep Bakersfield for affordable. That's very important to me. I believe that every working individual that has a full-time job should be able to afford the home that they live in. So for me, if this land is below, is, is cheaper, and that's why it's attractive because it's our one land in this area, then we need to keep it that way so that the people who potentially come into this neighborhood and build can keep the prices low in this area. So um, that's one thing. And I did also get the opportunity to meet with the applicants. And one of the points raised is that recent law that actually was signed into law by the governor in September, close to the end of September 22, SB 6 and AB 2011. And that's probably, Mr. Boyle, why you didn't have that in your report, because I, I believe you said, they said it was August, and the law was not signed into law until late September. So I just want to clear that up too on behalf of the city. I think you guys are doing a great job with the general plan and I'm sure it'll be amended to address, to address that going forward. But SB 6 and AB 2000, uh, 2011 are simply, the purpose of them is to add housing, not to eliminate housing. And by approving this project, we'd be eliminating potentially 300 residential spaces. And to say, well, in July, all commercial land will be able to be built, residences will be able to build on commercial land. Well, we're, we're already be beneath, below, far below our arena numbers. Why would we do a swap with this new legislation for already zoned residential land? That doesn't make sense to me and I don't follow that argument. Um, furthermore, I happen to build schools for a living. And one of the things that we like to do is different delivery methods where the architect and the designer are one entity. And there's a rule that we can do that, but we have to meet the skilled and trained workforce requirement. We can't use that here in this county because it is very difficult to find apprentices and those who have graduated and meet the graduation requirements from the apprenticeship programs to, f to form your skilled and trained workforce spaces to be able to even actually use SB6 or AB 2011. And that's why we can't use design, build, and lease, lease back um, construction delivery methods. Um, furthermore, there, those two things are, that it's not attractive, especially with the prevailing wage rate requirement that increases your cost for construction by almost 30%, maybe even more right now with the increasing labor costs. So to say that we can swap, we can rezone this land and rely some on developers in the future wanting to buy the more expensive commercial land and turn it into residences and pay prevailing wages to do, I mean, it's just absolutely absurd. So with, Knowing all of these things, this is the reason why I cannot support the application. Thank you, Commissioner Neal. Um, seeing no additional speakers or commissioners wishing to speak, um, I'll just give some thoughts on the project. Um, I, um, I'm going to start in, in my context, uh, 1980 will sound like history, but um, I am always um, very fond looking at the zoning map of the Northeast Hills of Bakersfield. Um, I was um, in later years of college um, when hilltop developments, rezoning, and this area really became a viable growth. Uh, Bakersfield really grew into this area. You know, I remember growing up fondly, um, being at Lake Ming, being at Calm, um, 
you know, the beautiful orange groves before you get to the canyon. And then, you know, in, around 2006, that, that character started to change as we grew in this direction. And I think um, one thing is you look at the zoning map, um, I feel like this, and I think both the applicant and residents tonight admitted that there's something special about this portion of our city, whether it's the cooler weather, whether it's the warmer weather in the winter, um, whether it's the topography, whether it's the seismic activity, the river flowing through it, um, it's special. It, it isn't endless, it's not flat, it doesn't, one block is not the same as the next. Um, we're confronted with nature and its beauty in a way that we aren't in a lot of other parts of city, the city. And I think um, we don't really have, one of the things I miss about old school planning commission is we used to have a printed map of the entire city. And it was awkward because it was the only thing we had to reference, so we would have to get up and look at a printed map. Um, but thankfully, they upgraded to computers, so we have the zoning map available to us. But what um, I apologize that those in the audience are not seeing is if you kind of zoom out from this site and look at this northeast quadrant, what's very interesting is we have a lot of zoning designations that are not used very much in the rest of the city. We have open space. We have hilltop developments. We're, where developers are confronted with natural topography, natural constraints. And so the form of how we grow in this direction looks different. I also think what's very interesting is as you keep going north and you keep going east, within a mile you are, you are very realistically at the edge of our city. Unless we start building single family homes in Kern Canyon, there are constraints to our city. So we're looking at the edge of our city. Um, granted, there's still room to fill in, there's still room to grow. and. Um, you know, I think as we look at this application tonight, I um, I think if we were looking at a conditional use permit on a C2 piece of property, I would have a different interest, uh, a different view of this project. You know, I think um, highlighting the many acreages of commercial property that is vacant right now, um, and this site, which would be the largest of the storage facility sites in our city. Um, I think the the consequence is that we, we would create this holistically commercial zone in an area that wants to feel rugged, wants to feel natural, that wants to relate to both what's there and also to the natural. And that that's not just something that I see, that's something that we enacted in our, our zoning map as a community. And um, I love Commissioner Com Lo uh, Lomas's um, kind of succinctly need and benefit. And I do think, you know, general plan, Zoning changes is the opportunity for us to say as a community, sometimes we mess up, and sometimes maybe what we thought would be the best use is not the best use, and the applicant has the opportunity to show us why this this property would work better for a different use. Um, I, you know, and I, we're seeing that a lot with commercial properties, you know, translating to multifamily housing. We're seeing a lot with, um, as manufacturing changes what it looks like in a city. You know, we're seeing a lot of these zone changes come through. And I think, um, to me, this site, um, the community benefit of it being a commercial site, um, I think we have commercial sites that are thoughtfully located at prime intersections already planned for this neighborhood. And I don't see um, a community benefit to a zone change. Um, when, I think more so than many parts of our city, we have a thoughtful vision for what this community wants to be. One that you can, we have a trails plan, no other part of the city. Uh, there's a few other master plan communities that have trails plans, but you know, a, a whole city, you know, quad, quadrant wide trails plan, you know, houses. And so to me, I think the, um, the need wasn't really, to me, demonstrated. Um, I would be curious, I know this is not maybe the best time to ask staffing questions, but as we're seeing zone change requests for multifamily away from, is, does the city keep a tally of new sites that densify versus sites that go away so that we kind of know as a community if we're holistically adding housing versus subtracting? Uh, yes, yes we do, more recently than in the past. Okay, so that is something we'll continue to see, okay. But, I'm a data person. I won't, I'm not really a data person, but I enjoy, I academically appreciate data, and so that's great. Um, yeah, so yeah, I would love to see a report on that sometime. Uh, maybe when we do that, uh, the next housing update, 
be great to see that number. Um, so with that, and then I think, you know, to me really the, um, besides that bigger idea, the logistics I think also of uh, zone changes are all the different boxes crossed and Caltrans not currently accepting the site is kind of a big box to not check. So with that, I also um, would be looking for a motion, um, but I can't currently uh, appro uh, recommend approval of this project. Oh, um, so I will look for a motion or any additional uh, speakers. So moved. Oh, oh. I make a motion um, to uh, take staff for staff's recommendation and um, deny. Thank you, Commissioner Neal. May I have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Lomez. Commissioners, please cast your votes. A vote yes is a vote for denial, just to clarify, right? That's correct. We Um, we're having technical difficulties, Commissioner Bashir Tesh, and anyone else locked up? Okay. Sorry, it's just you. <laughs> oh, we're back. Close it in uh, um, it, the, the dialogue's now open. Do you want to try double pressing? Oh. Oh. Shout, uh, commissioners, please cast your votes one more time. So the, the motion passes, right? Yes, Would, it does. The motion passes to yes. deny. Yeah. So motion passes with Commissioner Biddle and Commissioner Komen voting against. Do I say that? I believe so. Yep. Um, That's accurate. Kidding. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Chair Kaner. Yes. I'd like to read the appeal, but while I have a captive audience, I think this discussion Please. was beneficial on a number of fronts. Uh, number one, it shows the age of our current general plan. Uh, it also, I would like to remind the audience that we are undergoing a comprehensive general plan update, bakersfield2045.com. Uh, we really look for input such as what we've heard tonight on how this area can be developed. So again, bakersfield2045.com. 25, bakersfield Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Are you going to read the appeal? Uh, okay. Now I will. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now that After you've that. plugged the website a few times. Yeah. Thank you. So decisions of the commission are subject to appeal by any person that believes they are adversely affected. The appeal must be filed in writing within 10 days from the date of the commission's decision. The appeal must be addressed to the city council and include the appellant's interest in or relationship to the project. Identify the decision appealed and address facts and reasons why the commission's decision should not be upheld. And once again, this is your commission is making a recommendation to city council, so we will be taking a denial forward to city council. Thank you for reading the appeal. Thank you for everyone for attending, and thank you for that clarification. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item seven, communications. Johnson, are there any communications? Uh, yes, we will be having a meeting on March 16th, and as I mentioned, uh, we tentatively scheduled the housing element annual progress report for that meeting. Would you be able to provide uh, updated housing numbers for that meeting? Is that enough time? We will try if we can get that together, yes. If not, I'll come back. Um, we also have a workshop that we want to provide on speed limits from the previous meeting. Um, so these are items that are on our agenda that we will bring forward. Fantastic. Thank you for the update. We look forward to March 16th. Um, Madam Clerk. Agenda Next. item eight, commission comments. Does any commissioner have any comments? 
I do. We've got the Brendage Lane Navigation Center's Pickleball and Music Festival at Jastro Park, March 11th, starting at 9 a.m. And then we have Flood Ministries um, Spring Gala coming up March 25th. So hopefully we'll see some people there. Cool. Thank you for that. That sounds fantastic. Um, any other commissioner comments? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Agenda item nine, adjournment. This meeting is adjourned at 821. Have a great evening.